Uh, oh, yeah, find me. Where is it? I don't know. Da 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 dee. Ah, there you are. I found you. And yes, I got sound. That's working. That's excellent. And I should get rid of the echo because there is an echo. Uh, that is essentially it. Let's turn off the speaker so there's no echo. Where are you? Yeah, no more echo. All gone. Got some light on me. And um, make sure I'm pretty much in the center. Don't worry about everything behind here. The scenery in the future is going to change. Um, and I'm doing this workshop because, oh gosh, my timing. Usually I do a video every single day and somewhere along the line I missed one. And it was actually because my, my computer was updating. Couldn't do anything. Nothing. Nothing. So I've run around. How's it going, B? I've been running around trying to get equipment because I am now officially unemployed. I have lots of time and I'm going to do more of this sort of stuff. Uh, I went, getting, I had to go and pick up my webcam, my new webcam. It finally arrived and it's, it's behind there. Back there, you can see it. There is a, a Blue Yeti microphone and my webcam is in the brown box. It doesn't look very fancy and I just got to open them up, plug them in, figure out how to use them. <laughs> I'll be really good at that, I'm sure. Um, but I will get it sorted out, and then we'll go from the phone, which has been just painful, to an, an actual proper webcam. That is my intention. There's four of you in the room. It must be early in the morning or late at night or one of those, so we will get on with this rather than me rattle on as, as much as I have. Um, I had been planning to do this a long time ago, I believe I wanted to do it like on Monday or Tuesday, but that didn't happen. So let's kick off. Um, and if there are any problems with sound or video, as always, chuck them in the comments and I will get to it as soon as I can. Although I can't do very much with a phone, it's, it's just, you know, it's set where it is and that's sort of how it's going to work, unfortunately. But it won't be for much longer. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Weller and today we're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons and specifically I'm going to go through a beginner Dungeon Master workshop and what I want to deal with is your very first game. Uh, your very first game is probably going to be, oh, it was terrifying for me, it's probably going to be terrifying for you. I know some people, I've met a few, who start off and they seem to just they're like ducks to water and it's all easy but it's not very common. I think most people who start off dungeon mastering get quite nervous. The butterflies set in and you, know, you just sort of all tighten up and you, you kind of panic a little bit. So we're going to talk about how to actually deal with that sort of issue. Your very first time as a dungeon master. And you know what you're trying to do is you're essentially trying to do something you've never done before. You're actually trying to be a dungeon master but you don't know how to do it. Now you can go and watch other people doing it, which is a really good idea, and you can think that you're prepared, but once you actually have to do it yourself and take the reins, it can be a bit unsettling, as I've said. So here are a few things that I want you to pay attention to. One, do something that will relax you, okay? I, I don't really care what it is, as long as you are relaxed when you're going into the game. As much as you can, you won't be totally relaxed. If you're totally relaxed, you're probably asleep. But try to relax, do something that will help. Listen to music. I've actually talked about people saying, you know, using beer, not too much, just a little bit. Okay, things like that. Anything that will help you calm down. Don't, you can't avoid mistakes. Guaranteed that the, all the dungeon masters before you weren't able to avoid their mistakes. And essentially, mistakes are an indication that you are learning. You actually have to make mistakes yourself or see somebody else make mistakes to actually some, learn something new. And the, the learning that you do best, the, the really concrete learning that you're going to actually um, take on board are the mistakes that you made, not that somebody else made. 
So just remember that when you start making mistakes, because you will, and <laughs> it's all right, don't worry about it, it's fine, everybody did. Even the best of us at Dungeon Mastering have. Um, I can tell you that Matthew Mercer and Chris Perkins, they've all made plenty of mistakes. And anybody who says they didn't make mistakes is lying. Lying through them, <laughs> they really are. Okay, so <clears throat> I want you to reduce your expectations of yourself. One of the hardest things is everybody wants to be perfect and get and be phenomenal, um, be a, a live wire, try to duplicate what they've seen the other dungeon masters do or they've seen on the internet or TV or video. It really doesn't matter, but lower those expectations. You can't expect too much of yourself the very first time. I want you to listen to what the players are actually saying. Now remember, 20% of what they say is that's only part of what they're communicating to you. The other part is the body language and how they shift and move and their reactions. So you need to pay attention to what they say, their body language, and their reaction to what you do and say at the table. Now you have done this before. Almost everybody has a fairly good understanding of body language because 80% of our communication is body language and you do it every day. It's a skill you've always had, okay? So don't worry about thinking, I don't know how to read body language. You do. You have done it every single day, probably from the, the age of one, even two onward, <laughs> okay? So pay attention to what they actually are doing with their body. Are they folding their arms? Are they open wide? Those sorts of things indicate whether they are having a good time. You can usually pick up if somebody is having a good time. People laugh or smile, then you know they're having a good time. If they're frowning and they look sort of grumpy and they're off doing something else, then you know they're not having a good time. So make sure you're having a good time and they're having a good time. And if things aren't going well, call a break. How's it going, Mario? <laughs> Welcome to the stream. So if things aren't going well, I really want you to consider taking a break and then have a think about what you could do differently come back five, 10 minutes later and do something differently. Another alternative is simply to just sit down, take the break and just talk to the players and say, look, give me some options. Tell me what would make the game funner. What would make it fun for you? What would make it exciting for you? What is it you wanted to get out of Dungeons and Dragons? What can I do to change things? Because right now people aren't having fun or they're getting bored. And just use the feedback from the players to help you guide your session. I know that sounds um, robotic, but seriously, I ask for feedback at the end of every single session. Every single session I will say, did you have a good time? What did you like? What didn't you? And you, those are sorts of questions that you can ask at the end of your session, but you can ask them in the middle of a session if things aren't going well. Okay, so remember that. Now the first time dungeon mastering is always the roughest, but it will get easier with practice. You will get better at it and it won't be quite so um, frustrating or stressful. I know the stress, I always found it quite stressful when I started out, but it will, it will reduce. I want you to keep everything really simple. I don't care uh, how complicated the adventure is that you've selected, you can chop things away and make it more simple for you to actually manage because you have to get through this stuff, right? So make it simple for you. If that means reducing the number of monsters, then do it. I'd also suggest try to stick with level one. Level one characters, that's the lowest complexity you can get. Start at level one, don't start at level three, don't start at level five, start at level one. It's much easier for you to manage. Uh, also, when it comes to monster types, if you have more than one monster type, that's probably too much to start off with. Stick with one monster type in your hands or that you have to control at one time. And that'll make it simpler. You only have to have one stat block open to read and, and function through. And once you've done that, then cool. Uh, when it comes to having to, if you don't want to get rid of all the monster types, use them in waves. So maybe you have the minions, the, the smaller troops come in first and then the big baddie is it the final wave, the second wave, once all of the, the minions have been disposed of. And then you're still essentially only controlling one monster type, but you've done it in one combat, 
and you've done it in waves, so you've reduced the, the amount of stuff you have to actually uh, track. And there's no flipping back and forth through pages, which you'll always find difficult. I still find that difficult. And uh, yeah, or you can just photocopy your stat blocks and have them on little cards so they're available for you straight away so you don't have to flip through the pages. Also, when it comes to the number of creatures, monsters, NPCs that you're dealing with in combat, I would stick to, stick to maybe six as your maximum. Don't go any higher than that. Otherwise, you've got too many things to control at the table. You've got enough to do as it is. Just reduce the number of things you have to actually maneuver around the table, whether that be theater of the mind or you're using a grid and a battle map of some kind. Um, I've already talked about using waves. It's actually a really good technique and I highly recommend it. Still really useful for somebody who's not a beginner. Wave, waves of monsters, different types can be really, really helpful. Okay, next. What happens if the players ask me uh, can I do something and I don't know what the rules for that are. The rules don't cover this. What do I do? Ah! Okay, so relax. Pick up a d20, that's a 20-sided dice, and say, look, I want you to roll a 20-sided dice and you're going to add whatever, whatever skill or ability modifier you think is related to that particular task. Does that make sense? All you have to do is get, get through it. It's either going to be a skill check or an ability check and if you're not too sure between the difference of doing a, a contest or just a straight difficulty class check or DC check that's difficulty class where you set the number that they have to actually succeed at don't worry about it just make it a difficulty class don't worry about the contest you can worry about contests later on if you're unsure about them so setting a difficulty class just pick a number does it seem easy does it seem hard Okay, if it's easy, it's a 5 or a 10. If it's reasonably hard, then it's going to be a 15 or 20. If it's near impossible, then it's 25, 30. Does that make sense? Pretty simple, nothing to it. And literally, just go through the skills and have a look. What skill is kind of related to what they want to do? Pick the one that's most suitable. If there's no skill, then just pick an ability modifier. What ability type is actually going to be useful to you in this situation and then pick the one that's going to work now I need to give you some examples and I realize that how's it going Jack nice to see everybody there it's good to see everyone ah black devil mamba nice <laughs> I remember a lot of people here and <laughs> that's good news I'm glad to see that people are communicating with me because we're going to have questions and answers at the end of this right so I've covered the real basics uh, I don't want to go into it too much because I feel like when it comes to a beginner, if I throw too much information at you all at once, then it's going to be too hard for you to manage. So today's workshop is just about the things that I talked about. Take those, put them into your first session. And if it's you're beyond your first session, there will be some of the things that I've just talked about now that you can apply to future sessions when you run your game or game session for the second time or the third time or something like that okay so I'm gonna do that so if you found this video helpful or informative please share like and subscribe uh, if you haven't subscribed already uh, there's that little bell thing apparently you click the bell thing and then of course I understand you get the occasional notification to be fair I honestly can't stand notifications from videos so I understand if you don't want to click the little bell. But I will tell you now, you should just come to my channel because every day there's a new video, apart from yesterday where I missed one because that was the, my final day of work. Basically, I was a bit rough and the computer was playing up with me. Okay? Uh, if you have any questions about being a beginner dungeon master or just dungeon mastering full stop, then just put them in the comments or after I've done my little exit out of this video or workshop, um, you can ask me at the end of the live stream and I will hang around, answer a few questions before I have to go somewhere else. Uh, now, if you want to support me, uh, watching my videos is really helpful. But I don't know if you've noticed, but YouTube is flagging just about every single video and demonetizing them or classifying them as not suitable for most advertisers. Even things that shouldn't be. Uh, and this is because the robot is just picking up on keywords that are spoken 
or in the tags and the titles. So watching my videos is great, but I'm not going to get an awful lot of revenue from that. If you really want to um, support me, I am absolutely not starting a Patreon page. I don't care because I've my understanding is that Patreon has just gone downhill. Um, it's not an advantage to you, and I don't feel that it'll be an advantage to me. If you want to support me, if you buy stuff online, then just click on the affiliate link below in the description. I will put it in there later, and that can help me. I get a small commission, you pay no extra, and if you don't buy stuff online, it's fine too. I don't mind. But that's how you can support me. I think that's the best thing. I don't really want people paying me to do this. I just want people to actually support me if they feel like supporting me. And that's it. So, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Okay. All right. I'm not trimming this video, so I'm not going to do a big pause. If there are questions, I'm going to look through the comments because I've been blah, 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 100 miles a minute. And I just need to just track what I was going on here. Frank. Good. Jove Kryptonite. Good Jove Kryptonite. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What's good, what do you got here, Jack? You like the hat. This is actually my first dungeon mastering hat. Um, and I haven't got rid of it. Uh, I probably should, because uh, I feel like there might be something growing in there. But I'm not taking it off, because then you would see what's growing in there. So, you're not seeing. It's my secret. Uh, okay, what else we got here? Support how to D and D. Thank you. You have always supported me really, really well. I I can't. can't you, I think you just comment on every single video that I put up, and I can't pronounce your name. Um, the only language I know is English, and I'm not even very good at that. <laughs> so, aha! Uh, Never get rid of the original. No, I'm not getting. No, it'll, it'll stay. I'll just have to clean it somehow. Um, First one is the best. Yes, it is the fir the first one is the best. Okay, so what's Kryptonite got here? Um, he said everyone had fun, but when I describe places, I stutter and forget the description. Okay, let's let's help you with that Kryptonite. I think I think I did a video called Imagine a Scene, and this is what I do because I'm a guy and I'm very visual. Um, most guys have a very visual, spatial brain. Women tend to have a very um, audio written brain. That's sort of how they're wired up. But so for me, I picture an image. And usually what I'll do is I, I watch far too many movies, okay? And I've read far too many comic books and looked at far too much fantasy art. And I will think of a scene usually in a movie or a piece of artwork that I really like or a comic book and I will describe what I imagine in my head. Now, if you can't do that, just having a picture and describing what you see there will help you get past the stuttering. Does that make sense? Honestly, it's the best way to get past describing something is just have a picture and just describe what you see. And if you can actually have a picture in your head, that's even better. That's the best way for dealing with that. Um, if you are um, a woman, then I would suggest Thinking back to a book that you have read and a scene that you liked. I know that a lot of women remember scenes from books quite quite easily. I can't do it. Okay, so you like that? Cool. I'm glad that was helpful. But yeah, I know a lot of women when they, they, they read a book, they will remember a scene and they can actually describe it word for word. The wizard's books are stuffed full of information per chapter. Do you memorize everything? Absolutely not. There's no way I could. I know that I have friends. I've got a friend called Simon Abbott. Hello, Simon. And Simon can remember everything he reads uh, like, like it's just programmed into his brain. I don't work that way, so I can't do that. Um, do I have a trick? Okay, so this is, this is my trick for dealing with um, trying to remember bits and pieces from a book. When I get to a section and I start like, I don't remember all of this, I need to read it, but I don't have time, I deliberately, I honestly, I deliberately get them onto an off topic. I take them off topic. I let them talk about Star Wars or um, the latest um, craze, you know, Lord of the Rings or whatever. 
politics. Sometimes we have to deal with history lessons. Uh, it's one of the things about uh, geeks and nerds is they like to retell a lot of information. So I will capitalize and exploit that while I, oh yeah, 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 and I'm reading, I'm reading the book, catching up. That's how I do it, okay? And then you have to know how to get them back. So um, a big thump on the table, or hey, I'm ready to go, um, you can shout it out. Or uh, if you can't get their attention that way, often I'll just grab some miniatures and just plonk the biggest thing on the table just to see their reaction, and they're like, oh, what's going on? What, what happened? So that's uh, another way. There's lots of different ways of getting players back, their attention back on you. Okay, so that's how I do it. Uh, where else? Uh, I think you just answered the question though. Ha ha. Yeah, well, I, I think I might have answered a bit more. So I, I probably should go back through these questions, but I'm going to go back to Frank because Frank's got a little bit here. Fred, I just um, did my first session of Minds of Fandelva. Excellent adventure. Um, had a great time. Combat was fun. Good. But I keep getting stuck. Um, on fog of war and who can see what and tips okay tips for fog of war forget about fog of war <laughs> okay just ignore it just decide roughly where you think they can see and where they can't see um, and honestly if you use a grid just draw out where you think they can see to that's your fog of war nothing more than that if you're using theater of the mind you can make it up any way you might I'm um, like the players will never know, so it doesn't matter. Fog of war, yeah, don't worry about that sort of stuff. It's not important. What you say is uh, what they see, and what you say is what they hear, and what you say is what they smell. Does that make sense? So, yeah, you are their eyes, ears, touch. You are their senses. Um, if you don't describe it, it doesn't exist. You had the same question on the fog of war. I'm glad I was able to actually <laughs> answer that question. That's good news. Okay, what else we got here? Um, let us scroll back a little bit because I, I noticed that I, there was a lot of questions. Imran, never mind, I read it wrong. Whoops, thanks for all the advice and whatnot. Okay, all right, I'm not sure what that was about, but <laughs> at least we got it. Um, we used a grid, but I keep, oh, okay. You use a grid? Look. There's nothing wrong with using a grid. You don't actually have to use a grid. You can still use a map, but with no grid. Um, and I did a video on that particular topic not so long ago. And um, yeah, you don't have to worry about drawing out, having a, a square grid. You don't have to go and buy some expensive piece of equipment. You can use a piece of paper. You can use a whiteboard. You can use pretty much anything. Um, okay. I'm just going to scroll back here a little bit more. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is, I, I was looking at the world uh, zones, time zones. Now, I've already been told by my family I should not stream for eight hours. And I was going to do like a whole lot of live streams. Because there aren't actually that many live streams for Dungeons and Dragons. There really isn't. Um, I look at them and I think, ooh, maybe that's something I should do. Not everybody, one, most channels will do one live stream or two live streams a week, and that's about it. Uh, or occasionally. Whereas I could just live stream every day, over and over again. Anything that I'm doing, including my Dungeon Master prep, including my little crafty bits and pieces, which I think I will do. So, yeah. Um, okay, what else we got here? So there probably will be a lot more of these videos at different times so you can ask questions. Okay, so Black Devil Mamba, can you give some advice on when t when you are DMing with two kids um, that don't like each other? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, so first of all, if you have two kids who don't like each other and you're trying to get them to play at the same time, time at the same table, there's no easy solution to that one. I don't, I don't think I can solve that one for you. Okay, it's a really important that the people that are playing at the table, whether they are adults, teenagers or kids actually do re can get along and like each other if they don't uh, they're not really a good suit for that particular table and if the kids don't like each other there's no there's no solution for that I, I hate to say it I, and I I know I've said this before on a few of my videos that I can't give you all of the solutions to your problems 
Nobody can. And if they said that they could, they are lying, okay? But uh, there are ways of dealing with that. I would go with figuring out how to bring in somebody who um, can can separate them um, and chew up some of the time so they're not they're not arguing at the table. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yeah, good. All right, so we're going to just quickly scroll back through there. I saw a few more questions I should answer, but I just want to make sure I got them. Um, okay, Imran had here, Fred, I had one question about Dark One's Blessing, and I had a player use it on a higher level monster. Is there a limitation, or does it instant KO? Okay. Well, I don't actually know too much about that particular... Um, yeah, I don't know what, too much about the Dark One's Blessing. I'd have to look it up. Um, I can probably take a note of it, Dark One's Blessing, and have a look and maybe come back to you on that. That seems like a... If that seems all right to you, Dark One's Blessing. One's Blessing. Yet again, another thing I can't answer. Okay, right. Let's, uh, let's go through here. Da -da 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 -da. Kryptonite had said, yes, he's talked about that. I think we've covered most of the things. Oh, here we go. Amazing so far. Thank you for mentioning the pros like Matthew Mercer. Matthew Mercer is a pro. Let's, let's remember that. He's got the biggest audience out of everybody, including Chris Perkins. There's probably more turnover for Matthew Mercer's stuff than for anybody else. Um, and probably the most watched video has got to be Matthew Mercer and a group of people playing with Vin Diesel. It's, uh, it's really, really popular. Okay, let's go down here, down this list. I, um, I noticed there were some new comments. Okay, Black Devil Mamba said uh, they are sisters and they enjoy playing with their cousins, but sometimes they butt heads together. Get their cousins involved. Okay, Black Devil Mamba, if you've got sisters at your table and they're, they're quite young, get the cousins. If the cousins are interested in Dungeons and Dragons, because they will help break them up, utilize peer pressure. Even peer pressure exists amongst children. Does that make sense? I always found that peer pressure works really well where I work, or, or did work, <laughs> okay? Uh, peer pressure is what we use as the catalyst for change, and you can do the same thing with the kids that are at your table. Honestly, peer pressure is the best tool. Okay, the RP, RPG Master. How can I get people back on track when I'm about to describe a new scene? Okay, I think I just described a little bit about that. Big loud noise on the table. I've dropped my books on the table to see if that you know, gets their attention. Usually it scares them. And once I get them scared and they sort of stop and like, then I start talking again. Or you can just say, okay, quiet, get them to slow down. And I've used other techniques. Sometimes I've just um, started packing my stuff up. Um, now that's a very drastic technique. And I would use that as a last resort. I'll just start packing my stuff up and putting it away. And they'll, they'll look at me and like, what's going on? And I said, well, I figured you guys were happy with what you were doing. And I would, wasn't needed anymore as the dungeon master. You guys can keep doing your thing and I'll, I'll just go home. Unless, of course, you want to play. So I have done that. That's worked. Um, as I said, grabbing a big monster and just putting it on the table where their miniatures are. If you're using miniatures, we'll shop them in. Um... That's probably the best way. There are other ways. I think what I'll do is getting people back on track. Maybe that's a workshop and I'll write some notes and have a really good hard think and talk to a few of my friends so I know they've got some techniques that they use as well. Okay? Does, uh, does that help? Hopefully it has helped you in some way. All right, what do we got here? Uh, King Play 987 says, I have a question about mounting. Okay. I understand the mechanism around it except for when... A player moves then mounts do their movement reset and become that of the mount no the look when you mount a creature it's half your speed okay and when you dismount a creature it doesn't actually really state exactly in there but it should read to mount and dismount is half your speed so usually you will mount and uh, you might have moved uh, maybe 15 feet or whatever you move to the horse to get onto it. 
the horse gets its own movement, which is separate from the player's character. It can also use an action, but that action can't be used to make an attack unless it's an independent creature, and most mounts will not be an independent creature. So they can only dodge, dash, and disengage. Does that make sense? So that's the easiest way to deal with mounting. So they can move to the horse, get on the horse, use half their speed, and then the, spe and the speed of the horse or the mount, they can move their movement, and it's all cool. No problems. Okay, Cool Keg Computer says, if I'm DM DM DMing my first campaign, should I try to learn all about the classes of my players, or leave it up to them to know their own classes? What about when they level up? Um, I almost never check a character sheet. Seriously. Now, if you feel that somebody's cheating, uh, you can check it. Usually I know when somebody's cheating, and I just don't say anything. It's usually the players who will tell me, look, I know they're cheating. I know that class. They're cheating. I want you to do something about it. When they do that, when the other players come to me and say, look, somebody's cheating, da, 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 I'll usually follow up. I don't usually worry about learning all of the information for the players, characters, and their classes. All I will make sure is I have the player's handbook, and if I want to check it and I'm a little bit unsure, I can look it up if I want to. But often I won't. Usually I'll look it up later. So if they, if they hoodwink me um, and they, they uh, take me for a ride, it's all right. Next time I'll have it sorted out because I'll check it. And usually I'll check things after. Or if you're really, really um, trusting, you've got somebody who you really trust who's a bit of a rules lawyer. Utilizing rules lawyers is one of the best things you can do. As you can say, look, is that right? And uh, get somebody else to look it up for you. And if you've got a rules lawyer at the table, they will usually know all the rules to the letter. And it's just about whether you are happy with their interpretation. And probably they will just read the text and recite it word for word. That's often happened to me, and it could well happen to you. So that's the easiest way to deal with that. Leveling up. Um, I mean, you could check their character sheets when they're leveling up, but it's not a big issue. If you're talking about leveling up using XP, calculating XP or using milestones, that's up to you. Whatever works for you. I find myself using a combination, sometimes milestones, sometimes XP calculation, and sometimes in the same campaign, which can really confuse the players. And like half the time they're like, Fred, are we leveling up this session? And I'll say, mm, not today. And then they'll say, next time, are we leveling up today? And I'll say, yeah, why not? Okay, you just decide how that's gonna work. Uh, there, are, there are pros and cons to using both systems and they are both worth using. It just really comes down to how much time you have and what you feel is comfortable for you to manage. A lot of players don't like milestones. Some like XP, some like milestones, and don't like XP. So, you know, you do what you can. Um, King Play 987 says, Ah, that makes much more sense. Yes, yes, it does. Okay, Imran says, How can I introduce magical weapons? Okay, I haven't gotten this far with players, but it would be useful for the future. Well, I literally have a video on how players actually find or get magic items. And it's up to you. I usually don't introduce magic items till about level 5. Uh, probably because the mechanics at level 5 kind of break down at that point, so it doesn't matter if I chuck a magic item in there. And I highly recommend using magic items that are of a utility nature rather than a combat nature. Now, players will prefer magic items that have combat features, but you do not need to use those. You can introduce ones that have a utility feature. And they're bound to come up with something really bizarre that you weren't expecting at your table. And uh, that's all right. That's fine. Um, you know, magic items can disappear. Magic items can be made no longer magical, or stolen, or lost, or something like that. It's up to you. Okay, so I'm just going to have a drink of water, guys, because it's getting warm. I closed all of the windows and doors, which was not a smart idea. But I just needed to keep all the birds and the crickets and the kids who are coming home from school from coming through onto the, <laughs> onto the phone. 
<laughs> okay, what else we got here? Um, da -da 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 -da. Magic items, I think we covered that. Um, da -da -da -da. Okay, uh, the RPG Master has said, What do you do when players get impatient and groan at the game table and you have trouble coming up with something new? You will always have somebody who will groan at your table. My suggestion to you is, is pick up on what they're saying, make sure that you look at their body language, make sure that you pay attention to how they react. You need to figure out what it is they like about Dungeons and Dragons. Is it combat? Is it role play? Is it skill checks? Is it exploration? Those are the things you throw in. Um, usually they'll be groaning if you haven't done any of that for some time. Um, it's usually about trying to figure out what style of player you have at the table. And you don't want to have every single person at your table playing the same way. It's actually good to have a mix. You'll get a, um, a better game out of it. It'll be more exciting because people will have to try things they're not used to. It will take people out of their comfort zone. So make sure you have, if you can... Don't discourage having different player styles, but you do need to learn their player style. And maybe I need to do some videos on different play styles. There's, there's information in the Dungeon Master's Guide. If you don't have it, um, I'll do some videos on it. And that does explain the different types of player styles. Very generic. It's sort of, it's not, not everybody sort of sits nicely into each cubby hole. Sometimes they're a mix of different things as well. Does that make sense? Okay, what do we got here? Um, we all have trouble coming up with something new, so don't worry about that. Fake it till you make it. My suggestion, when you don't know what to do, just fake it till you make it. Uh, how about magical item, the broomstick? Well, yeah, ma a magical item that's a broomstick allows them to fly. Remember, flying is incredibly powerful in Dungeons & Dragons, but that's fine. You know, things can happen to um, brooms. Um... And a broom that flies is no good in a dungeon. So it's great if you're in an open area, but once they go into a confined area, flying around on a broom really won't help very much. So it's only useful when they have a big wide area or cavern or something like that where there's space to use it. Okay, what else we got here? Cool keg computer. Uh, oh. By the way, I saw that you did a Princes of the Apocalypse review. Yes, I did. I actually, it's been sitting on my uh, video manager for a very long time, and I was d trying to decide whether I would... I wanted to reshoot the video, and then I thought, no, I'm being picky. It's just I, there was so much umming and erring, and I kind of... I didn't like it. And then I decided, no, I just needed to suck it up, put it out there, and let people make a decision about whether they found it useful or not. I don't particularly like Princes of the Apocalypse um, as an overall story. Uh, I'm sure there are people who can run it well, but if you were to break up Princes of the Apocalypse into small blocks or adventures and use them throughout your campaign, I think that's an awesome tool. I think it could work really, really well that way. Um, thank you for that, and I'm sure you did... Not enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. I, I didn't enjoy it that much. Uh, it was hard work. <laughs> um, Black Devil Mumba, what have you got here? Um, you're lucky. It's freezing cold over here in the States. I prefer to be warm than cold. I get, a, it's about eight to nine months of winter. I, I call it dry winter or windy winter, winter winter, and then wet winter. And then we get summer. And then, <laughs> so... You know, snow and freezing, I can totally understand. So keep warm, don't get cold, don't get sick. Okay, what else we got here? Um, I like the way it was used in one of the latest acquisitions videos. I'm not quite sure, I must have missed something there. Um, the broomstick. Ah, yes, yes, Acquisitions Incorporated did use a broomstick. I don't actually get to watch their stuff very often. As you know, I'm very busy. Um, and I'm probably going to still be busy, <laughs> uh, even though I am no longer employed. But, what have we got here? Um, flaccid carcass. Fla flaccid cactus? Whoa, okay, alright. Uh, wow. <laughs> 
Okay, any good adventures for beginner players that cover lots of different aspects of play, like a tutorial town? Uh, look, The Lost Mine of Fandalva is by far one of the best products I have seen. If I was to say anything else about what you could find useful, um, I would go with the, layer, the Book of Layers. Um, Book of Layers is basically produced by um, Kabold Press. So the Book of Layers is essentially a collection of adventures, very short ones. They're about three, four, five pages long, and they have maps and locations, and it's very easy to use. Very good for a new player, very good for a new dungeon master, and they're fairly interesting too. And there's also Prepared. Uh, I think it's called, a, it's like a, a dozen short adventures or mini adventures or something like that. It's also made by Cabold Press. I've done reviews on those products and you should be able to find them. If you just type in um, Prepared uh, Cabold Press, you should find my video on that topic. The same as the Book of Lairs. I made sure that there was a decent review on YouTube for the Book of Lairs because it's an excellent product. It, it might cost a little bit more than you were expecting, but honestly, it's, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, that, I think that covered that question. What else have we got here? Oh, um, Daryl, what do you got here? Fred, your videos are fantastic. Thank you for doing them. Would you please consider eventually doing one on lair encounters or just more various creature encounters? Thanks again. Yeah, it's going to happen. Um, I have a book here somewhere, and it's full of monster tactics. They're really simple monsters. I'm trying to stick with stuff that's really simple and easy to run. But if you want a, a sort of um, an encounter layer video, then I can do that. I'll, I'll put something together, okay? It might take me a little while. I can't guarantee that it'll happen straight away. But yes, I'll do it. Um, everything will eventually come. It's just finding time. Okay, what else? Um, Imran, you've got here. I have a hard time keeping with the same campaign and always start a new one. Any tips for keeping focus on writing one campaign? Well, one, don't write one campaign. I've just started a new campaign and my players have called it Zenith and I added on Zenith Knights. And it's a combination of Dungeons and Dragons and the Justice League. And they're currently exploring a, a round disc that's floating around the world of Cerebus. They, they selected the name. I didn't do any of that. I just said, so what's this place called? And they gave me a name. And I said, what's this campaign going to be called? And they said, Zenith. So you don't have to create all that stuff. Uh, my suggestion is, it's all right if it's a surprise for you. If it's a surprise for players, the players won't know if it's a, um, whether you created it or not. Just... Just make it up as you go or get them to actually give you information. Look, yesterday I was running a game and one of my players said, what are the gods or deities of this world? And I said, well, um, they're not the Forgotten Realms gods. You tell me what sort of god you think would be appropriate for your cleric. Uh, tell me what their name is. Tell me what their alignment is. Tell me what their focus is. You know, what are they the, a god of or goddess of? And then once you've done that, you know, give me an idea of what the emblem or uh, what they're related to or what their symbol is. He created all of that. I just wrote it down. So easy. Piece of cake. You can do that too. Uh, don't worry about the name. Um, it could be the simplest name and I'd still have trouble. <laughs> okay. All right. What else have we got here? Uh, I think I've answered that question, question Imran. If I haven't, you let me know. Um, so, Flaccid Cactus, thanks heaps, and sorry about the name. <laughs> okay. Cool Care Computer, does your partner play D&D too? Okay, so my partner works 10 hour days. She's now the only one employed in the house. And uh, she did try to play Dungeons and Dragons with me. Um, she's not, she likes Harry, Harry Potter, and so I thought it would, it would be possible. But I, I don't push her into it. I don't expect her to. Uh, I know my players got really excited when my partner showed up at the table a couple of times. But she's coming home from work. It's so late. She's just too tired to do it. She's played a couple of games, but she probably won't continue doing it. So only a couple of times, and that's it. So I think I've pretty much covered that. 
a Harry Potter themed campaign. Why not? You could have a Mad Max themed campaign. You could have a superhero themed campaign and use Dungeons and Dragons mechanics for 5e and Dungeons and Dragons monsters. Uh, you can do anything you want. That's up to you. Okay, what else have I got here? I think I've covered all the questions. So, um, there's a few people in the room. My voice is going to give out. We're now, we're now into almost 45 minutes, although I suppose the first few minutes consisted of me just setting up my camera and blurting out nonsense and stuff like that. Uh, I will probably be back yes tomorrow and Saturday. So tomorrow for me in New Zealand is Friday. Uh, for you, I'm not too sure. Right now it's Thursday and it's about, what, 4.41 p.m. in the afternoon, almost going into the evening. I will eventually have to stop because I have to go and prepare dinner for my partner. Imran, no, you helped out. Good. Um, I always do improvise. My players have a lot of fun. Good. Look, uh, learning to improvise is really tough. I totally understand that. Uh, you get better at it, and uh, everybody can always learn something. You, you know, it doesn't even the best improvisers can learn something in terms of improvising. There's there's no end to it. So I'll keep doing what I'm doing. That's right, the way I see it, and the players have fun. Yeah, as long as they keep coming back. You know, when you have players that don't come back, you know things aren't going well. <laughs> All right, what else we got here? Um, Greek slay, Greek slay. Hey, same here. Laugh out loud. Yeah. Cool. Oh, look, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I want to just take a break. Um, you can come back and I'll do another one of these and ask me questions some of the time. Oh, I've got another question. I better do this. The RPG Master. Um, I'm in the process of making a Pokemon mystery dungeon style D&D campaign and my new players seem interested right now. I'm having trouble with the status effects from the franchise what do you suggest okay so i actually ran a pokemon themed dnd adventure myself it was a one shot just take the status effects from pokemon and uh, see which dungeons and dragons if you're playing 5e just see what conditions match up and you don't have to uh, create new conditions just use the ones that you think mostly relate to Pokemon. That's my suggestion to you. It will probably condense it down and make it a bit simpler, and it will also probably, you'll have a few situations where some of the status effects might not be completely duplicated, but it will simplify things for you. That is my suggestion, okay? Um, Fred, you are D&D genius. No, I'm not. And I, I would like to repeat to those people who think that I am a genius. I'm a guy who lives in New Zealand. That is the, the bottom of the world. It's a very small country. And I'm no different to any other dungeon master. The only difference is uh, I might be one of those people, and there are other dungeon masters who do, who is trying to communicate the very basics that I know. And that's really it. It is. It's just basics. Most of the people that I know see my videos and say, Fred, yeah, yeah, Ira, I saw your video. Yeah, you covered the basics. That, it's, not, it's not rocket science stuff. It really isn't. It seems like it. It's only because I've been doing it for a little while. And a lot of my, um, my friends have really awesome styles. I would love to be able to show you that, to, um, but it's going to be really difficult. They play in such noisy locations. And also, too, I noticed that every time I try to film my friends and the people who play at my table, they, they react and they move differently. And also, too, uh, censorship is a big thing on YouTube right now. They can't be themselves. They can't say what they would normally say because it would, it would probably just wind up getting the channel um, disbarred. And I don't want that happening. Uh, okay. I think that's covered everything. So I'm going to wrap this up. For those of you who are wondering what the heck's going on, I'm going to be back. It's about 5 o'clock, almost 5 o'clock. I'm going to put the tags, descriptions into this video. I'll put in any information that I need to. Um, I'll tidy it up as best I can. I'm not going to trim the videos anymore because YouTube keeps messing it up. Okay? And then once I've done that, if I've still got some time, I'm going to jump on. I'm going to stream again if the 
phone will allow me to because I still need to deal with uh, setting up the webcam and I might just do uh, a little, I don't know, make a miniature. I feel really bad. I did some videos on where to buy cheap official Dungeons and Dragons miniatures and it's been super popular and as I think as a result the demand for those um, Dungeons and Dragons board games just skyrocketed and as a result Amazon has just increased the price. It's just going through the roof and I feel like the only way to get around that is I, I could do another review on another product if I could find one uh, but it wouldn't be official it would be like a stand-in and the price would just go up again so I'm just going to start doing videos and live streaming them and showing you how to make your own miniatures um, I'm not going to show you how to do humanoids I'm not the best sculpt sculptist I'm not I, look I'm not fantastic at that sort of that thing I'm not um, and AJ Pickett uh, the Mighty Glue Stick, he's done quite a lot of stuff around that, but he doesn't put it up on YouTube that much. He's do, he does mostly law now. Um, DM Scotty, he does some of those um, videos, you know, crafting stuff. But I thought what I'll do is I'll do a whole lot of just how to make your own miniatures and monsters. I like monsters, so let's just make a whole bunch of monsters. You guys can sit around, watch what I'm doing. I'll make sure I put uh, information on materials and tools that I'm using and yeah I think that's a, a good idea so yeah I'm gonna say bye and let my voice rest I'm gonna go and tidy up this video I'm gonna open all the windows and the doors and let myself breathe and I will probably be back very shortly and I'll see you later and where's the button now I gotta find the button I feel like the little finish buttons just disappeared on me it's like where's the button there's no button how do I stop it YouTube's trying to uh, YouTube's trying to continue my live stream. They won't let me finish. No. <laughs> Where where's the button that says I can stop? Uh, there, there's I don't know how to do this. This is just ridiculous. Uh, what does that do? I don't want to press that. Burn the phone. <laughs> oh dear, that is crazy, isn't it? Okay, all right. Let's see if I can just do it this way. Oh, let me stop this. It's work. It worked. No, it didn't. It's reconnected again. You silly thing. <laughs>